Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're just waiting for a few more to join us, then we'll get started in just a few moments. Everybody will be placed on mute as they join, but we'll just give it a couple more minutes, then we can get started. OK, I'm going to hand you over to Felicity. <laughs> Hello, thanks, Ali. I'm Felicity Thau, a physiotherapist and member of the Flippin' Pain team, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the first online Pain Do You Get It event. We've previously hosted in-person events across Lincolnshire with the aim of raising awareness of the prevalence and impact of persistent pain, as well as bringing the latest in pain science to you, the people who live with pain, either in yourself or someone you love. Of course, due to COVID, we've had to adapt these events, and so now you can join in from the comfort of your own home. This does mean a lot of you will be tuning in from outside of Lincolnshire. Don't worry, the messages still apply to you, but links is the, where the campaign is based, so you'll hear a lot of references to the county. At Flip and Pain, we want to flip your understanding of pain to help you better live with it. And to help us do that today, we have Professor Cormac Ryan and a team of pain clinicians, as well as a panellist who lives with persistent pain herself. Before I introduce the panel, here's what you can expect from this session this afternoon. Cormac will be presenting an introduction to pain and pain science, and that will be followed by a question and answer session where you can share your questions with our experts. Please be mindful that we have a very large audience and we're keen to answer as many questions as possible. This does mean that we will prioritise questions from those people living with persistent pain, but please note we can't give tailored health advice during this session. There will be an email address provided at the end of the event for you to send any further questions to. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box shown on the, on the slide at any time and feel free to introduce yourself and say where you're from. The webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards. We've muted your microphones and so I encourage you to get up and move around as much as you need throughout the session. And of course, you already know where the toilets are. So to our panel, I have great pleasure to introduce Cormac Ryan, Professor of Clinical Rehabilitation at Teesside University and a community pain champion for the Flippin' Pain campaign. He has over 15 years of experience in pain management research and has published over 70 peer reviewed journal articles, obtaining more than £1 million in research funding. Unfortunately, Fen Kipley has been unable to join us because of technical difficulties today, but we are fortunate enough to be joined today by Nikki Jones, who lives with persistent pain herself. We also have two clinicians working in persistent pain settings, Sophie Gwinnett, a consultant clinical psychologist, and Mahin Coley, an advanced physiotherapist practitioner in pain management. We'll come back to our panel guests a little later on, but for now, I'm going to hand over to you, Cormac. Thanks, Felicity. I'm having technical difficulties. For some reason, these slides will not move forward. I don't know why that is. They were working just fine two minutes ago. <laughs> Isn't it always the way? Um, let me see if I can do something about this. Apologies, everyone. Bear with me while I while I try and sort these technical difficulties out. Uh, let's try this again. And that. Yes, there we go. You're all very welcome to today's talk. Uh, thanks once again, Felicity. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Um, wherever you're listening from, whether you're from in your kitchen, at home, whether you're in the office, whether you're in the car park at Tesco's, wherever you're watching, you're more than welcome. Um, for the individual um, that's in the bath, we can all see you. Your camera is still on. Only kidding. We can't see you at all. All the cameras are turned off, so you just relax in your bath. Just like to keep you on your toes. So as Felicity said, I'm Professor of Clinical Rehabilitation at Teesside Uni. I'm also the Community Pain Champion for the Flippin' Pain Campaign. 
I'm a physiotherapist and a pain scientist. I've been studying pain for the past 15 years or more. Uh, it's an absolutely fascinating topic and hopefully I'm going to share some really uh, interesting and useful insights with you over the next 45 minutes or so. So the aim of today's talk is to change the way that people think about, talk and treat persistent pain. There are six key messages that I want to convey. That persistent pain is common and can affect anyone. That hurt does not always mean harm and that everything matters when it comes to pain. Also that medicines and surgeries are often not the answer and understanding your pain can be key and that recovery is possible. What does the average person on the street think about persistent pain? How do they understand persistent pain? When I asked Google for a picture of the average man on the street, this is the picture that Google gave me. Speaking as an average man, I'm not very sure she has a, an unrealistic view of what the average man might look like. But nonetheless, I believe that the average person would say that pain only occurs when you are injured. That the greater the injury, the greater the pain will be. And that persistent pain means that the injury has not healed. Take a look at these three statements and see how much do you agree with them. Hopefully, by the end of this talk, you will strongly disagree with these statements. But to begin, I'm not going to talk about pain at all. I'm going to talk about our visual system and how our visual system works, because understanding how our visual system works can give us a really useful insight into understanding how our pain system works. Take a look at this visual illusion. I've circled two squares, an apparently brown square on the top of the cube and, a, and an apparently orange square on the front of the cube. Well, one thing's for sure, they don't look like they're the same colour. Now, if I take out the background, they now appear to be both the same colour. They both appear to be brown. I can guarantee you that I haven't actually changed the colour of that square. They've remained the exact same, but here it looks orange. Here it looks brown. How does this visual illusion work? Well, let's explain it by better understanding the physiology and the biology of our visual system. Light reflects off images in the surrounding area. It goes in through the lens of our eye onto the retina, which is at the back of the eye, where it shines on rods and cones, which are little receptors which convert that light information into electrical information and send it via the optic nerve to the part of the brain that deals with vision. At that part of the brain, there's a little person called Sheila. Now, Sheila is surrounded by millions of jigsaw puzzle pieces. And as the light information comes in, she uses that to build a jigsaw puzzle piece of what's going on around her in real time in a split second. And what she creates is what you see. So don't think of vision as an input to your brain. Vision is an output of your subconscious brain. It is a creation of your subconscious brain. And it, yes, it is based or influenced by the light information coming in, but it is also based upon our previous experiences, our expectations, our beliefs, our attitudes, our understanding of the world. All of these influence the picture that Sheila creates for us. All of these influence what we see. Now let's use that understanding to explain this visual illusion. We've got our cube, we've got our brown square at the top and our orange square at the front, or apparently orange square. We've also got some darkened area to the left, suggesting shadow or shading, which would suggest a really bright light coming from the other side. There is not, but it's drawn in such a way as to give that impression. So when Sheila gets this information coming in, she will get the same amount of light energy coming from both squares. 
because we know that bro both squares in truth, in reality, are brown. When that light information comes into Sheila. Sheila would usually decide that there must be the same color and thus create a picture where they're both the same color. However, everything matters when it comes to vision. She takes into consideration the contextual information around it, specifically the shadow in this, in this case. If she thinks that she's getting the same amount of light energy from both squares, but one of them is in a darkened, shadowy area, then she assumes it must be brighter, and thus she makes the assumption that it's an orange square. Now, when we take away the context, when she no longer has to consider the effect of the shading, it's much easier for her to come up with a more accurate picture of what's there. She just gets the same amount of light energy from both squares, and thus comes to the assumption that they're both the same color, both brown, and that's the image that she gives us. It goes from being a thousand piece jigsaw of the sea, really hard to put together, to being a four piece jigsaw of a cow, really easy to put together. So I want you to think of all our senses in the same way. They are not necessarily inputs to our brain, they are outputs of our brains. They are creation of our subconscious mind, whether that's vision, touch, taste, whatever. I want you to start thinking about pain in the same way. Start thinking about pain as a sense. Also, start thinking about it as a, an output of our brain, a creation of our subconscious mind. And yes, it is influenced by information from our bodies, but just like vision, it is also influenced by our previous experiences, our expectations, our beliefs and our attitudes. All of these things influence our pain experience. I want you to keep this in mind as we move forward onto the rest of the talk. So let's start off with our first key message. The pain is common, and can affect anyone. If you've got pain, because pain is invisible, it's easy to think you're alone, you're the only one who has it. It can be really isolated. But actually, 30 to 50% of people in the UK experience persistent pain, a staggering 28 million people. And it accounts for about 29% of the total disability pain related conditions. Now this is for Lincolnshire specifically, but actually this number scales up to the UK as well. Pain is a really big problem. Now we in the scientific community have, um, you know, learned an awful lot about pain in the past 50 years, made some amazing discoveries. Unfortunately, not a lot of that has filtered to the person on the street or the clinician on the street, which has meant that a lot of myths, misconceptions and misunderstandings about pain exist. We believe that knowledge is power. We believe that if we can put that scientific understanding in the hands of people with pain and clinicians, giving it to the people at the coal face, we can help to bust a lot of those myths to help people to manage their pain better. That brings me on to my second key message, that hurt does not always mean harm or injury. So what do I mean by this? Take a look at this case study from the British Medical Journal, one of the most respected scientific journals around. This is, uh, uh, tells the story of a London builder who jumped from one platform to the next. And as he did, a six inch nail went up through the boot of his, uh, went up through his boot. He was in absolute agony. He was rushed to accident and emergency. They gave him fentanyl, a really strong painkiller, but it made little or no difference to his pain. When they cut off his boot, what they found was that the nail had passed directly between the toes. 
This man was completely uninjured. There wasn't a scratch on him. It's a perfect example where you can have no injury, but lots of pain. Now let's look at the flip side. This is another case study from a journal in injury prevention, which is a sister journal of the British Medical Journal. In this case, a 63 year old Polish man arrived at accident and emergency, complaining of headaches and dizziness. When they scanned him, they found a 12 centimeter knife stuck in his head. They were pretty shocked to find that. And the story was told that he got home the previous night, slightly tipsy, had fallen over. And when he woke up, he couldn't find his favorite knife. He could only find the handle of the knife. No prizes for guessing where it was. This is a perfect example of where you can have little or no uh, um, pain, but terrible tissue injury. OK, so you might be thinking these are all just, um, you know, individual one off stories that are nothing to do with me and my pain. They're not real life people. So as a result, I've put in a real life person with a real life story. So this is Felicity, who you met at the start of the presentation, and this is her dog, Ozzy. Ozzy looks uh, particularly guilty. That's because he was being walked one day. He spotted a rabbit, chased after it, and this pulled poor Felicity over, resulting in her breaking her collarbone, as you can see from the X-ray there. Now, at the time, Felicity reported little or no pain. She reported feeling nauseous and she reported uh, uh, feeling a crunching sensation, but no pain. Um, another beautiful example that hurt does not mean harm. Hurt does not mean tissue injury. And if you want to hear more about that, I'm sure Felicity will be only delighted to tell you all about it after this. Um, so why is this the case? How do we begin to understand this? Well, we can begin to understand it by understanding the physiology and by understanding that everything matters when it comes to pain. I want you to meet Asumpta. Asumpta is Sheila's first cousin. She's from the Brains Department of Health and Safety. She is to do with the part of the brain that decides whether we experience pain or not. If you can imagine this, if Asumpta believes that the situation is dangerous, she will want to draw attention to it and get something done about it. And thus, she will produce pain. On the flip side, if Asumpta believes that the situation is not dangerous, she will not want to draw attention to it. She will not want to get something done about it. And thus, she will not give pain. It is as easy and as difficult to understand as that. But what evidence do we have that as Sumta exists? Well, there's a beautiful study from Oxford which shows she exists really neatly. I like to think that the setup for the study was a little bit like this scene from Goldfinger, where James Bond was attached to a table with a laser shone on. In the study, Participants were recruited. They were these were normal, healthy participants. I say normal. They volunteered for a pain study, so perhaps they're not all that normal. But nonetheless, in the study, a laser was projected onto three different parts of their foot. When it was projected onto the first part, the researchers said, that's fine. That's a nice safe area. We can use that for the rest of the study projected the laser onto the second part of the foot. They went, no, that's really dangerous. We can't apply the laser there. That, that, that would be too dangerous. So we won't use that for the rest of the study. And then they applied the laser to the third part of the foot and they kind of rubbed their chin and went, ooh, mm, OK, this looks like it would be reasonably safe to apply for the rest of the study. 
And then they carried on applying the laser to those two parts, the safe place and the not so safe place. And each time they applied the laser, they asked the participant to say whether it was painful and how painful was it? What they found was that when the laser was applied to the high threat area, the place the participant believed to be unsafe, the participant reported more, was more likely to report experiencing pain and they were more likely to report higher levels of pain in comparison to when the laser was projected onto the low threat or the safe area. Now, what the researchers didn't tell the participants is that both areas were completely safe. Both areas were physically identical. There was no difference between them and they were completely safe. Only the belief within the person that this location was dangerous was the difference between the two areas. And this was enough not just to influence how the person responded to pain, but actually to influence whether they, they felt pain or not, and the amount of pain, exactly what a sumta does. So let's move on to a sort of a real life situation. Imagine you're trying to hang up a picture and you're hammering a nail into the wall. You miss the nail and you hit your thumb. That stimulates little receptors on the nerves in your thumb, and that causes them to uh, depolarize or fire or stimulate that first nerve to send a danger message from your thumb all the way to the spinal cord. When it reaches the spinal cord, there's a little gap between the first and second nerve, and then the second nerve relays the danger message up to the brain. Now in that gap, the message is passed on by releasing little chemicals called neurotransmitters, which travel across from the first nerve, bind with the second nerve, and when enough of them bind, that's enough to trigger that second nerve to depolarize or fire and send that danger message up to the brain. When it reaches the subconscious brain, Asumta asks, how dangerous is this really? Now, this all happens in a split second, out with your conscious awareness, and at this moment, you're pulling the hammer back for your second blow to that thumb. That would not be a good thing. This is a dangerous situation. So Asumta asks herself, how dangerous is this really? She's likely going to assume, yes, this is dangerous, when she considers the, the danger messages she's receiving and the context of the situation. She's going to want to draw your attention to it and get you to do something about it because the purpose of your pain is to protect you. And so she'll give you pain and you, the conscious person, become aware of it because we're not in the real world anymore. I've decided to make you a handsome devil. And that makes you aware you drop the hammer and it stops you from hammering that thumb. And it's really super effective, your pain alarm system. Now let's fast forward five or six months. Let's say that the pain in this thumb stays. It doesn't go away. Persistent, or oh, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. If Asumta believes that the situation is more dangerous than the amount of danger messages coming up, she will want to uh, draw your attention to it even more. What she can do is she can send down excitatory messages which release more neurotransmitters into that gap, which can actually increase the amount of danger messages coming up to the subconscious brain. A positive feedback loop. If she receives more danger messages, she's more likely to believe that the situation is dangerous, therefore more likely to want to draw your attention to it and get you to do something about it, therefore more likely to give you pain. On the flip side, if Asumta believes that the situation is less dangerous than all the danger messages coming up would suggest, she can send down inhibitory messages. These inhibitory messages block those neurotransmitters, reducing the amount of danger messages going up via the second nerve. She receives fewer danger messages, thus she's likely to assume that the situation is less dangerous 
and thus less need to draw your attention to it and get something done about it, and thus less need to give you pain. This is in the short term. What about in the long term? What about persistent pain? In persistent pain, the alarm system can become supercharged. So our nerves, which are sending these danger messages, if you can imagine, they become super, super busy. They can, simply can't cope with the demand of all the danger messages that want to be sent. So they learn how to adapt and how to send them better. It's a little bit like the postal service at Christmas time, which simply can't demand with all, can't meet the demand of all the messages and parcels that need to be sent. Thus, the post office recruits more staff and those staff work longer hours. Anyone who's received a parcel at 6.30 a.m. on Christmas Eve will, will know what I mean. Similarly, our alarm system, our pain alarm system, has chemical changes which occur to help it to send danger messages better. They make it more sensitized. And these chemical changes, which include things like an increased numbers of receptors for those neurotransmitters, making the pathway more efficient, these chemical changes can actually spill over into neighboring nerve pathways. And this process can give the impression that the pain is moving and that the pain will get over, appear to come from over a bigger area. Can you relate to this? Does this seem sound familiar to you? Have you feel felt that your pain moves or sometimes is over a bigger area? If you do, that's a real indicator of a, a sensitized alarm system, which is associated with this persistent pain condition. When I'm explaining this to my own patients. I tend to use the um, sort of metaphor of a car alarm. Imagine you've got a brand new car. You park it at work, you run up your flights of stairs and you start typing away at your computer. Meanwhile, a burglar looks through uh, some bushes, sees your new car and says, I'm going to have that car radio. Runs over, breaks the car window, grabs the car radio and runs off down the road. Two minutes later, the car alarm goes off. You jump up, you run downstairs, you find your car broken and you're devastated. You call the police, you call the RAC, the police come, they take a statement, the RAC come, they replace your car window and they replace your car radio. And then the RAC man says, I'll give you a little tip. I'm gonna turn up the sensitivity of your alarm. Next time any burglar comes and tries to break into your car, he'll get a rude awakening. You say, thanks very much. Go back up your stairs, you start typing away in your office. Meanwhile, the burglar looks out through the bushes, says, I'm going to have that car radio too. He runs over. As soon as he touches the window in your car, car alarm goes off. You jump up from your computer, look out your window and shout, Oi! He gets spooked. He runs off. You run down the stairs. You find your car is perfect. You're so relieved, not a scratch on it. You turn off the car alarm, but you leave the sensitivity of the alarm right the way up because it's you need it to protect your car and it's doing a wonderful job. It's just proved its worth. You then go back up your flight of stairs. And you start typing away. Two minutes later, the car alarm goes off. You look out your window and you see an elderly couple have just glanced off your car as they've walked by. Your car was in no danger, but it was enough to trigger the car alarm. You run back down the stairs, you turn off the alarm, but you leave the sensitivity right the way up because you need the sensitivity right up to protect your car. You go back up your flights of stairs, you start typing away. Two minutes later, car alarm goes off again. You look out the window and the big pigeon sitting on your car. He must be a deaf pigeon because the alarm isn't making him fly away. But nonetheless, you run back down the stairs, you shoo him away, you turn off your car alarm, but you leave the sensitivity of the alarm right the way up because it's doing such a wonderful job protecting your car. You come back up your stairs, you start typing away, the alarm goes off again. 
Suddenly, the problem is no longer the broken window or the broken car radio. The problem is this sensitized car alarm. And it is interrupting every aspect of your life. I want you to start thinking about pain in the same way. Pain is a marker of perceived threat. Persistent pain is not so much due to tissue damage, but increased sensitivity of our body's natural alarm system. Our tissues will heal in about a six to 12 week time frame. They recover, but because of this sensitized alarm system, the pain can continue long after normal tissue healing has occurred. Let's start thinking about how this might relate to real life situations. How can we use this information to better understand pain and how to manage it? So information can influence our alarm system. It can learn to be more sensitive and more protective and it can learn to be less sensitive and less protective. Positive, accurate information can reduce the sensitivity of the alarm system. Negative, inaccurate information can actually increase the sensitivity of the alarm system. A perfect, a perfect example of this is about scans. Now, if you have a scan, for your persistent pain. You are statistically more likely to have a poor outcome. I'm going to repeat that one more time. If you have a scan for your persistent pain, you're statistically more likely to have a poorer outcome. Now, why is this? It's all to do with the information that comes alongside the scan. Take a look at this table on the right. This table here shows the percentage of people in the different age brackets going from 20 up the way to 80 year old, the different percentages of imaging findings for those different age categories. Take a look at uh, people who are 50 to 60. People who are 50 to 60 years old. These are healthy backs with absolutely no pain whatsoever. 80% of them experience or have disc degeneration, even though they experience no pain. This is just the normal change that one might expect over the usual aging process. These are the kisses of time and not necessarily a pathology. But imagine you have back pain and you go in you're scanned and your healthcare professional tells you you've got disc degeneration. How scary does that sound? How, what way do you think that will influence Assumpta? Almost certainly that will make her feel that there's greater risk, greater threat. She will want to protect the area even more and thus more likely she will produce pain because the purpose of pain is to protect you. Now, if the information was given correctly and clearly and positively, it would rather say that the changes on the scan are similar to what one might expect for anyone of your age. Um, but when it's not communicated that well, it can have a really bad effect. The next clip is from uh, one of our flipping pain friends, Pete Moore, and he really beautifully illustrates this point.
Sorry to interrupt, Cormac. It's Felicity here. Just to let you know, we can't hear uh, the video, ah, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. That, that is unfortunate. OK, thanks, Felicity, for letting me know. I'll, I'll move no swiftly along. In that, in that clip, um, Pete it was told by the healthcare professional who did a scan that his spine was like a digestive biscuit. Now, just think what impact that might have had to have been told that your spine is like a digestive biscuit, a crumbly, buttery biscuit. Couldn't even use a, 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 a robust biscuit like a hobnob. Poor old Pete must have, must have just spent all his time trying to avoid cups of tea so his spine didn't just melt or evaporate. This was a perfect example of where information from a scan was poorly, negatively and inappropriately communicated to have a really negative impact on the person's pain experience. Um, and this is something that better information can help to reduce. So as we now move in from uh, from I'm going to move on now from looking at how we understand pain to how we can use this information to better manage our pain. That brings me on to our fourth key message that medicines and surgeries are often not the answer. OK, so to begin, let's all thank our lucky stars for pain medicines and surgeries. These things are awesome and they can be hugely, hugely helpful in sort of situations such as road traffic accidents, major trauma, all the rest of it. Pain medications and surgeries are brilliant at that point in time and we're lucky to have them. But they are not so good for persistent pain. For persistent pain, they are not the answer, rarely. Pain management guidelines have shifted a lot in the last 20 to 30 years and they've moved away from recommending strong pain medication and surgeries towards more active physical and psychological therapies, such as um, advice to remain active, education, exercise therapy, and cognitive behavioral based interventions. Now, despite this, pain medications like opioids, which are not recommended, have little evidence to support their use and are associated with lots and lots of side effects, have actually been increasing in use in the UK in the past 10 to 15 years. The number of opioid prescriptions has increased by 127% in that time frame. We see a similar change for surgeries. For example, the number of spinal surgeries in the past 10 to 15 years has also doubled. This is despite the fact that after spinal surgery, as many as 60% of people are still left with ongoing pain. It's attractive to think that surgery will just remove all the pain, but it usually does not. That is why best evidence guidelines say not to do surgery for persistent pain, um, that these are usually not the answer. We need to find a different way, a more evidence based way to manage persistent pain. And we believe that understanding your pain can be key to this. And that it can help towards recovery. Recovery is possible. We believe that knowledge is power. We believe that if people understand their pain better, this can help to reduce pain related fear and anxiety, both consciously and subconsciously. Dampening down our pain alarm system and helping us to, to relax a little, but also helping us to consciously make more informed evidence based choices for our healthcare to make us uh, uh, to help us to choose active physical and psychological strategies like physical activity. Uh, um, to improve our pain management. This data from Australia is some of the best evidence that I can find to demonstrate that understanding is important and that recovery is possible. 
So this is data from about 1,500 participants or people who've gone through a pain clinic in Australia but that specialises in this form of pain education. Now they're getting a much deeper pain education than we're doing here. We're only just scratching the surface. But all the patients going through this clinic receive this form of pain education. They also receive a, a smorgasbord of physical and psychological uh, therapies. And all the patients coming through, on average, they experience pain of five out of 10, and they've experienced pain for about six years. And the different types of pain range from back pain to uh, neck pain, to fibromyalgia, to everything in between. What they found was that after the first month, there's little or no change in the person's reported pain. However, for those people who flip their understanding of pain away from this idea of tissue injury and that hurt equals harm, for those who flip their understanding, their pain reduces at six months a little bit and quite a lot at one year. In comparison, for those people who don't flip their understanding, their pain remains relatively static at six months and 12 months. It's a perfect example that understanding can be key and recovery is possible. But remember, of course, recovery is different for different people. For some people, recovery is a reduction in their pain. For others, recovery is returning to work despite their pain. And for others, again, recovery might just be feeling better in themselves despite their pain. It's different for everyone. I got to this point in the presentation with my next door neighbor, Jane. Jane said, OK, this is great. Really enjoyed this. So what do I do now? I thought, OK, right. Well, so this last part of the presentation is very much for Jane. First of all, I would say get as much good information as you can. You can find lots of really good pain science resources on our website, www.flippinpain.co.uk, and you can learn and understand your pain better. I think that's crucial. That's the first step towards your recovery and towards charting and managing your recovery. And I'm going to give you a quick sort of whistle stop tour of what that might be like with that better information to guide you. If we think about taking a systematic approach to your pain management and to your pain journey, if we think about all the different things we know scientifically can influence a person's pain, from joint loading to genetics to life events, anxiety, diet, sleep, social support, activity, all of these things we know can influence our pain experience. And cumulatively, they can all build on one another to uh, um, contribute towards our pain. What if we began to systematically tackle each of these? What if we began by tackling the anxiety and stress through meditation and mindfulness? What if we tackled the diet by increasing our fruit and veg? What if we tackled the poor sleep through better sleep hygiene? What if we tackled the poor social support by enhancing our social networks? What if we tackled the lack of activity by engaging in general physical activity? We know that increasing our physical activity levels can reduce our pain experience by as much as 20%. If we do all of those, we can have a positive impact upon our pain as part of a structured, systematic pain management journey. Now that journey may not be quick, but it's probably going to be a little bit quicker than you think. It may not be easy, but it might be a little easier than you think. All of these journeys require a single step. And we believe that getting better education, getting better informed about pain is the first step on those, that journey, because all of these interventions make sense if you have a more scientific and better understanding of your pain. If you don't, they don't make sense, and thus it's hard to engage in them. So getting back to the understanding of the average man on the street or the average person on the street of pain, 
that pain only occurs when you are injured, that the greater the injury, the greater the pain will be, and that persistent pain means that your injury is not healed. Hopefully, after this 45 minutes, you'll see that those statements are incorrect. Hopefully, you will disagree now with each of those statements, at least to some extent. Hopefully, you'll have taken on our flippant pain messages, that persistent pain is common and can affect anyone, that hurt does not always mean harm or injury, that everything matters when it comes to pain, that medicines and surgeries are often not the answer, and that understanding your pain can be key and recovery is possible. Just before I finish, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed to the flippant pain messages from our people with pain, to our clinicians, to our illustrators, to our pain scientists. Um, and thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very, very much for that, Cormac. That's brilliant. And I think important to say if you're sat at home now thinking, wow, there's a lot of information that was different to what I've heard in the past, that actually that's quite normal. Um, and often the first part of the, the journey in flipping your understanding of pain. Um, so this, this takes us on to our panel discussion and we've had loads of engagement in the live Q&A. So I've been selected a few things, but if you do have any um, questions that you want to get in there, please do type them in now. Before we do that, and while I bring some questions together, it would be great if we can ask our panellists to introduce themselves. So, Nikki, would you like to start? Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm 48. Um, I've had trigeminal neuralgia, which is a facial pain condition, for 18 years. Um, I've had multiple surgeries and I actually have a brain stimulator implanted. And I was really extremely disabled for a lot of years from it. But two years ago, I flipped my understanding of pain and it has allowed me to do a pretty spectacular recovery. Um, and that's been two years now and I'm doing really well. That's great. Thanks, Nikki. I'll bring Sophie in. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Sophie Gwinnett. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and I specialise in pain management. So. Um, I've worked in pain actually since 2002. I was working in the NHS for many years and um, came to Connect Health three years ago. Um, my, the aim in my work is to help people both on an individual and a group basis to find ways to lessen the impact of pain in, in their lives and, and to live well with pain. Thanks, Thanks Sophie, Sophie and Mark. And Mark. Hi everyone, my name is Martin Coley and I'm a, an advanced uh, physiotherapist practitioner in pain management working in, with Connect Health in Wolverhampton. I run pain management programmes alongside clinical psychologists like Sophie um, that aim to help participants discover active strategies to help manage their pain whilst moving towards the life that they want to lead. I'm also an independent prescriber and, and although that I can prescribe medication, my main role is to help uh, people reduce their medications um, by discovering alternative strategies and engaging with things that they enjoy. Although I'm sitting on this expert panel today, I'm by no means an expert on anyone else's pain experience. For me, it is the person living with the pain that is the expert, and my role is just to empower them on their journey. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, I'm going to have so, the loads of questions, where to start. What I am going to start with is, is probably a fairly common um, response to this kind of stuff when we're when we're talking to people about pain and Cormac I'm gonna I'm gonna probably go to you first um Frank said this is this is really interesting I'm, I'm kind of starting to understand what my physio was was getting at but are you saying this is all in my head can can you answer Frank yeah I absolutely can and the answer is no I'm not saying that the pain is all in your head um and then in some ways, I guess I am saying the pain is all in your head. There's a difference between saying, is the pain all in your head and is the pain real? First thing to say, all pain is real. And that's vital to be clear about from the offset. But that question then of is the pain in your head? Well, 
the way I explain it is that all our our sensations are arguably in our head. If we think about how our visual system works, if we think about Sheila and her creating our what we see around us, if we think about vision being an output of our brain, well then you can think, yeah, vision is in our, our heads, just like what we hear is in our heads, just like what we taste is a creation of our subconscious brains. And as a result, what we feel, including pain, is a creation of our subconscious brain. But that does not mean that it is not real, just in the same way as what everyone is seeing right now. Of course it's real, but it is our subconscious brain's perception of what is there. I hope that answers the question. That's great. Thanks very much, Cormac. Um, I've got a question from from Stephen, who I think it would be great to come to Sophie first of all, from a psychologist point of view, and then perhaps Nikki and see what your your lived experience of this has been. And Stephen wonders, we've also got Rachel asked a similar question. What's the impact of stress and emotions on pain? Sophie, I'll come to you if that's OK. Sure, thank you. I mean, this is, this is a question that I get asked a lot about this relationship between um, stress and emotions and pain. Um, I mean, what we know is that living with persistent pain in itself is a very stressful experience. Um, and quite naturally, there will be many emotional responses, um, including frustration, anger, sadness, loss, grief, anxiety about the future. These are all really normal and common experiences that are shared by people living with persistent pain and they're very natural. But the other aspect of it is that often the urges that we get or the urges that we experience when we're when we're having strong emotions might actually hold us back from um, managing our pain effectively. So quite often if we're sad, if we're low in mood or if we're very anxious or if we're stressed, our tendency is to want to withdraw. So to withdraw from meaningful activities, to withdraw from people that we care about or, or who care about us. Often what we want to do is kind of close down and hide away. And whilst in the short term that can feel helpful, actually if we use that as a long-term self-management strategy for a persistent problem such as pain, in the long term that has many costs associated with it. So we can feel very alone, we can feel very isolated, which then just adds to our experience of low mood and anxiety and stress. So part of the work that I do is around helping people to think about the long term strategies that they can use to to manage these experiences. So with things like stress and emotions, it's really helpful to kind of acknowledge how you're feeling and to acknowledge the thoughts that come up with particular emotional responses, but not to get too hooked into them and to instead make kind of choices about how you respond and what you do with your behaviour that are going to move you towards a more meaningful life and towards the kind of life that you want to be living. I hope that helps to answer some of it. Thanks, Sophie, that's brilliant. I did want to to ask you, Nikki, what your experience had had been in terms of the relationship between stress and emotions and pain. I, I agree um, completely with Sophie. Um, the learning how to manage my emotions effectively really helped me reduce my pain levels. Um, any, I mean, any kind of stress used to increase my pain levels dramatically. Um, physical stress as well as emotional stress, but emotional stress was very triggering. And um, yes, yeah, so I had to do a lot of work at um, learning the best ways to, to manage them. Um, writing, journaling about my emotions, I found very useful um, and various sort of psychological techniques and just not getting too caught up in them and using an awful lot of self-compassion. So you make the right choices for yourself, which feeds into what Sophie said about, you know, why why you do it and, you know, not not this reducing the critical self-talk. It's so important. It's really important. And important. it's amazing how much of an effect it has, though. Um, it's hard for people to understand, but it really does. 
hard to do, as you say, but worth, worth going down that route. Fab. Cormac, I'd like to, to pose a question from Lauren to you. Um, we talked about the, uh, the the car alarm, the sensitive car alarm analogy, which people really resonated resonated with people. Uh, Lauren asks if you haven't had an uh, an injury, say for say for instance, you've got something like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, there is some ongoing physical changes. Uh, there is some ongoing inflammation. Yes, people's pain systems, she says, can, can get overstimulated. But there is a burglar trying to steal your car at times. What would you? Uh, how would you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And like that's a, a Lauren, that's a really, really good point. I guess I would I would come back to thinking about it uh, in a way that everything matters when it comes to pain. We know that it's not just the information coming from our bodies. But our previous experiences, our expectations, our beliefs, our attitudes, our understanding of pain, all of these things influence our pain experience. Now, if we are aware that there is a burglar, if we are aware that we've got a condition such as rheumatoid arthritis, where there is um, um, that tissue pathology ongoing, that does not mean that we can't work on some of these other factors to help to reduce down the pain or to reduce our pain related fear and anxiety. So um, regardless of what is, for want of a better word, uh, um, uh, ongoing in the tissues, um, pain related fear and anxiety will only serve to increase the sensitivity of that alarm system and thus likely increase our pain experience and that's not a good thing whether you've got ongoing tissue pathology or not um, so it's i guess what i'm saying is understanding and being aware of pain science can help regardless of whether there's ongoing tissue pathology or not. Um, it, it's not that we're trying to dismiss the importance of that tissue pathology, but rather just an appreciation that everything matters when it comes to pain. And let's use all the, the resources in our toolkit to help to manage it better. Again, if Lauren was here in person, I could probably say, Lauren, does that answer your question? And she could probably go, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 hopefully it was helpful. Thanks very much, Cormac. Thanks. Um, I have a, a question from from Becky, who I'd like to, to bring you on this uh, in on this, Mahan, as a as a physio who works with people in, in persistent pain. Um, and again, come to you, Nikki, because what Becky says is she's got spondyloarthritis, she's got arthritis in her back, and finds lack of money to have massage, go to the gym, have PT sessions or private physio. Plus, she's working full time with two kids. These are big hurdles to staying well, general well being. Um, how can do you suggest how long can we follow physio advice in the long term for? So I guess what I'm posing to you, Mahin, is if you were to give someone some advice for the long term that you know didn't cost a fortune, like all the things that that Becky's mentioned, what would you be advising to someone? And then come to you, Nikki. How do you manage your pain through the long term in a in a cost effective way? Mahin, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I think that's a really really good. Um question Becky so yeah thank you for that I think we have that view don't we initially that if we're going to get some treatment then it's going to be something that's going to be hands-on treatment like a massage some people think acupuncture as well um, or that we have to go out and spend money on a gym membership um, to remain active and, and stay fit and I think the thing the key thing is when it comes to any um, sort of activity is pick something that you enjoy so a lot of the time we're suggested by our physios or we hear from other people that, you know, a gym's a great place to be. And it is, um, but only if you enjoy going to the gym. Now, there are lots of things we can do outside the gym to, to help keep ourselves active that are, that are, that are free to do. Um, so anything like walking um, can be really good. 
um, cycling and so on. But what I'd really say is pick an activity that you enjoy, um, focus on focus on that activity um, and perhaps go go down that way. With regards to the, uh, the part of the question around kind of the massage aspect, um, we've talked about certain things that can be kind of can give short term effects and those that can give long term effects. Now, with massage, massage can be really useful. It can be a really, really good tool um, for for help with with pain, whether that's relief that you get from a massage. But then we've also got to look at the effects of that massage and how long that lasts. And what we can find sometimes is things like massage. It has a short lasting effect, which feels good, but often we have to revisit that. So we have to keep going back for that massage to keep those effects going. Um, unfortunately, the, the effects of massage are not usually that long lasting. So perhaps there's something else that we can do to, to maybe put in place there. And, and what is it that's good about that massage? Is it the, the relaxation element? Is it the actual pressure element? Is that something that you can get someone at home to do for you if, if you find that's useful? Um, if it's a relaxation element, can we perhaps have a look at some other techniques um, uh, like perhaps uh, mindfulness or even going for a walk outdoors can be really, really relaxing, but find something that works for you. Um, there isn't a need to spend lots of money. That's the great thing about exercises. We can do that wherever. Um, there's lots of videos as well that we can find online these days that that can help us out with um, with exercising at home. So yeah, Becky, don't don't feel like you need to go to um, the gym or, or have a PT. Use the free PTs on YouTube. Sorry, Felicity, I can't hear you. Yeah, I think you can go ahead, Nikki. OK, uh, sorry. Um, I I don't actually spend any money now on my self management of pain. Um, I used to go to the chiropractor a lot. I haven't been for nearly two years. I manage it myself. I, I do what's fun. It is a lifestyle change for me. I it's not something I can. You know, just do for a short time and then not do again. It's I have to do a meditation every day. Um, do a lot of present moment awareness. Um, do fun things. I, I love to dance. I'll just do free dance. It's it's moving in a way that is good for you. Um, I've been cycling a lot and I use that time for very sort of mindfulness time and it's setting it all together that works in a, in a way for you, for your life. And you've got to find that way. But I found I didn't need to pay a lot of money anymore. I, I could really move away from that. I really empowered myself to manage my own pain experience. I didn't need to rely on anybody else or any medications. Um, I used to have to give myself sumatriptan injections. Um, now now sometimes when I have that pain I'll actually go for a bike ride and that's taken a long time to do that but and it's hard work but it's fun and it's an improvement in lifestyle so it's really worth it. Thanks Nikki that's brilliant. Uh, Cormac I've got another one for you. Um, we've got Sue who lives with uh, complex regional pain syndrome after an ankle trauma so persistent pain in, in the area of the ankle um, after an injury she says the the sensitized system and the car alarm analogy explains that but not the intermittent acuity of the pain I, I presume she means the intermittent kind of flare-ups or the fact that it's become bilateral it's now on both sides how would you explain that yeah well, what, what a wonderful Wonderful question. Um, and the honest answer is that I can't really explain that. Complex regional pain syndrome is is it is, the clue is in the name. It is indeed complex. I'm, my my heart goes out to you. It is a really difficult difficult condition. Um, but I can take a a stab at trying to explain it to some extent. In that. Our alarm system, when it becomes sensitized and when Assumpta is in kind of overdrive trying to protect uh, uh, our, our body, she can, she will put everything in place to try and, and protect it. She will do whatever she can and that might not necessarily 
simply be to do with um, pain. She will um, sort of increase all our alert systems, all our alarm systems, all our protective systems, our immune system, our um, movement, musculoskeletal system, every system that she can access, she'll put on high alert to try and protect the part of the body that she's concerned with. Now, the, um, that mirroring, why phantom limb pain seems to almost move to the other side is a particularly challenging issue. Some people talk about things like um, mirror neurons in the brain where um, essentially the, the system gets confused. It's trying to protect so much that it, it kind of, uh, um, I guess we touched on it a little bit in terms of how these chemical changes can spill over into different neural pathways and how it's a bit like if your house is on fire, you might call your neighbours to come and help to try and put it out and put them all on alert as well. And in a similar way, these chem chemical changes kind of spreading out to other neural pathways. It can be a little bit like that. Those other areas can go on edge, can go on to become overprotective, even if anatomically they're not right beside each other. Um, that's how I would try and explain the kind of the, the mirror effects, but no one knows for sure. Thanks very much, Cormac. As you say, complex is, is yeah. certainly the, the right word for it. Um, I'd like to come to you, Nikki, with a, a further question from Stephen, who was saying that living with pain is, is, is you know, it's tiring. You, you're living with pain and fatigue. How do you keep moving through both of those barriers? Um, that's very difficult and for a long time I I just plodded I was I was struggling um, again it comes down to self-compassion and and to be honest this is where support from you know the right healthcare professionals comes in to keep you motivated and to give you a reason to move on I didn't have that really um, I was just lucky that certain things happened to sort of give me the impetus to start to try some of these things and to learn the pain didn't mean harm reduce my fear and it it builds you you st if you start small you start with something that's fun and you see a small result that that's what gives you the sort of motivation to keep going and making small changes and it's really hard to be positive it's really hard to sort of take on these things and it takes an enormous amount of courage and I don't think anybody should, should ever sort of underestimate how much courage it takes to you know make these changes in your life and to take on yet another thing that might not work but they do and it's I, I talk of it like a picnic it's finding you know there's some staple ingredients in a picnic that we all have um, that will help, but it's finding what works for you in your picnic, and that takes some trial and error. But it's really worth it if you can find it. It really is, but it does take courage, and that's where again where peer support comes in. So if you can find a, a tribe who can sort of help you, that's really useful as well. And you know, cheerleading. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Nikki. As you say, there's no one size fits all. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a journey. Sophie, do you have any any um, input on that in, in terms of you know, how people push through those those kind of barriers? Sure. So um, I think it's really helpful just to recognise that there are you know limited reserves of of energy and of time or finances of all of, all of these kind of aspects of of trying to live live with pain. So it's about making meaningful choices. If you have limited energy, what really matters to you in your life? Who is it who matters? What experiences matter to you? What activities matter to you? Um, I noticed there was a, a question also, and I'm probably going to cover this uh, about, you know, should I be walking or cycling, you know, if my knees hurt? Actually, what I would say is it, it, it actually what what 
it's right for your needs doesn't matter it's about what are you going to engage in in the long term because it brings you some element of joy you know go for what brings you joy what what gives you a sense of meaning and purpose again because when when you're living with chronic pain you can feel very stuck and you can feel like those elements of kind of purpose and joy in your life in your life has been have been removed um, so yeah, engage with what matters, show up for all of the experiences that can still bring you an element of joy, not perhaps in the same way that they previously did, but still show up for them when you can. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, There's a, a question about opioids, which which is likely to come up in a conversation like this. It's a, a topic that comes up in the in the news an awful lot. Mahen, as a, as a physio who works in persistent pain, I'll, I'll put it to you. Helen's asking if you know, you've, you've had someone, um, I think Helen works with people in persistent pain as well, if you've got a patient in front of you who, who works with, um, who's on opiate meds and has been for many years, it can be quite stressful to talk about removing that medication. We hear lots of negativity about opioids. How do you address that? What would be your, your advice on the use of opioids? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I'm glad that's come up. So yeah, thank you, Helen, for that, because I'm sure other people on this will have a similar question to this. It's it's really not, not an easy start um, by any means. I think reducing opioids is is very very difficult so that's that's the first thing to to mention here especially if you've been on it for many many years now the first thing is is when we've been taking opioids for a number of years our body will be expecting that level of opioids okay now when if we completely stop the opioids altogether we would expect some quite harsh withdrawal symptoms so we wouldn't want to do that at any point and if anyone's on this, be listening to this talk today and they are on opioids, I'd, I'd urge you to, to not just stop your opioids. That, that's really, really important because that can be really difficult. And if you get some real spikes in your pain, that can actually lead to more opioids in the future as you go back onto yours and you, and you seek further opioids. It's, it's something strange and I'm glad we've come to, to this because often when we have pain, opioids work for a certain length of time. And I think Cormac mentioned this earlier in, in the sense that actually in the long term, certain medications uh, stop being helpful. So it might be the case where you are put on an opioid medication like cocodamol, you then visit, um, you visit a health professional, um, the medication stop working, you're put on something stronger. And there's a bit of a cycle that we see here and, and that opioid use increases over time. Now, if we were to stop the opioids, we'd get the, the, some side effects that I did, did mention before. I think the point to to know here is how comfortable do you feel first of all in reducing your opioids i think it's important to be at the right stage and at the right place is there any other support around you that can help support that that uh, reduction some of the work that um that we do we have a pain management program that's actually um works on helping people develop other strategies in place of opioids in place of medications Medication is only a very, very small part of the overall pain management picture. There's lots of other things that we can do to help to, ma to manage the pain and opioids are only a small part, but it's useful to know what those other strategies are. So if it's the case where actually you may not be seeing anyone for your pain, but you are worried about coming off to opioids, finding out whether there's any pain management services around you can be really important. So that's probably the key step. I'd always do this under guidance because of it's going to be a tricky time um, and you may have some pain flares. Even if you do it in a very, very gradual way and reduce your opioids, there is a chance that for a certain period you will get increases in your pain initially. OK, but those will likely to plateau and settle down. Um, it may not be possible to come off opioids altogether if you've been on them for many years, and that's OK to know that as well. But the less opioids we're taking, the less side effects that we'll probably be getting. And with less side effects, that can help us engage in the other things that perhaps we've not been able to engage in um, over the years when we've been struggling with pain and taking opioids. They can make us feel quite drowsy um, and, and so on, and, and that can limit activities that we enjoy. So the, to, an to answer the, the question, I'd, I'd make sure there's a support system in place, first of all. Um, it's done under guidance, knowing that it'll be a difficult journey, but by gradually reducing it, actually um, it, 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 can be it can be managed. I think Nikki, you might have um, some experience with this. I don't know if you wanted to, to share 
some of your experience? Um, yes, yes. Um, I've had quite a difficult time with um, opioids. I was on a very high dose of fentanyl. Um, it was actually, I mentioned that several things happened to start me on a road to recovery and actually reducing my fentanyl was one of them. I reduced from a 100 microgram patch down to 75 and that gave me, it sort of woke me up a bit. It gave me more energy, more sort of cognitive function almost to be interested to engage in life. Um, and I've definitely found every decrease, although the pain increases for a short while, it, I feel so much better after each decrease. It's, it's amazing. But I was absolutely certain that, that my opioids were helping me at one point there was there would have been no way I could have countenanced any kind of reduction and nobody was offering me anything in place of them so it was only when I sort of got some really good self-management in place that I could actually happily think about reducing unfortunately I didn't have the support you talk about which is so important and I reduced too fast and I've actually ended up in quite a difficult situation because of that um, but I'm doing really well now and I'm I'm on half the dose I was before, well less than half the dose and every time I reduce it's, it's so much better. Um, but please, please don't taper your opioids too fast. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. They're serious drugs. Thanks very much, Dick. You know, good advice. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pause to you, Cormac. You said that everything matters when it comes to persistent pain. Does that include the weather? You're on mute, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Go <Liz>. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it, it does include the weather. Uh, um, it, it includes everything. If I if I can, I'm going to spin back to a previous question uh, about sort of money and um, 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 sort of our, our economic state, and I, you know, we, you can't have any conversation at the moment without speaking about COVID and the influence that COVID is having on society at, at large. And, so, and it is going to be influencing uh, um, persistent pain and it's going to be influencing it through lots and lots of different ways. But one of the ways is through is from a financial perspective. Um, one of the most fascinating studies that I ever uh, came across was one looking at the um, economy and pain and people's perceptions of how economically safe and secure they are influences their experience of pain. Um, and I found that a pretty mind blowing finding when, when, when I read it. It really took home for me this idea that everything matters when it comes to pain, this idea that something that's way outside my body can be influencing in some way the the, the pain I experience. And that's, and that's a sort of a, a really robust scientific evidence to demonstrate that. If we think about the, the stressor that is being financially insecure is, how that can increase the sort of danger in me uh, 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 situation consciously and unconsciously. Um, it's a perfect example of how everything uh, matters when it comes to pain and weather is no different. And there are some really interesting studies could have sort of charting how people's experience of pain maps uh, 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 um, weather changes, etc. Coming back to the current question, but I think the, the economic one is one of the most uh, startling situations. And if we think about COVID, if we think about how many people are going to be uh, uh, economically affected by it, I think it's it's something we, we need to really be aware of in this time uh, in terms of how it's going to be affecting people with persistent pain. Thanks very much, Cormac. That's brilliant. Um, we have a, a popular question from Vanessa, uh, who I see Martin, your your um, mid reply there, but I'll I'll, I'll come to you for, for an answer live because I think it would be good to share. Um, Vanessa wonders she finds it difficult to know when a pain flare up is an indication that the exercise she's been doing is is just too much for her joints at that time, and how much is just 
my system is sensitised and I need to work through this. Does she push through the exercise or does she back off until it settles? What would be your advice, Martin? Yeah, it's nice and easy one because I've put half my answer down in the chat here, so I'll just read Excellent. it straight off that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I, that balance can be can be really difficult to get, I think. Um, but I think the key the key thing here is it, it it's thinking about that alarm system and how can we maybe just dampen down and settle down that alarm system a little bit. Um, it's really important to work with your pain rather than against it. I think in this situation now. If we had the example where um, you know things were causing pain, so let's say we do some exercises, it was causing some pain, but we carried on pushing through, it's likely that that pain may push back harder. So we might be just you know causing a flare up to um, to become a little bit worse in that situation. Alternatively, backing off may not be helpful as well because what that may mean is that we're actually getting a situation there where we're we're doing some activities, okay. Um, the pain gets a little bit too much, so we stop our activity. The pain settles down a little bit, and then we may um, bring up our activity again. And we get a bit of a cycle, and we call this the, the boom-bust cycle, where um, we have periods of overactivity and then periods of underactivity, and that's kind of related to the pain that we're feeling. Many people may, may have felt that before, and I think what the key thing here is to find what your baseline is. So if you're doing exercises and it's too painful, it may be that you don't stop doing those exercises, but you just bring it back slightly. And there's there's a saying, you know, um, uh, start low and build up, um, start low and go slow, sorry. Um, but yeah, building up slowly, I'd, I'd, I'd take, just as an example, let's say someone did a 20 minute walk and they um, were really in a lot of pain afterwards. The option would be to continue walking um, and doing that 20 minutes until the body got used to it. But again, that could be unhelpful. It could cause cause more of a flare. Or the other option may be to not do any walking, which again may not be helpful because our body's not getting that exercise, that movement. Um, and, and also then when we do return to walking, it may be more painful to do so. So what I'd probably suggest using this example would be to maybe half it. So go for something like 10 minutes um, have a bit, it may be a bit, a bit of an experiment with yourself, you know, to find out how much you can do. But afterwards, feeling like you could probably do a little bit more, but you're not going to at this stage. So that's probably the, that kind of key area. So stopping when you feel you could do a little bit more. Obviously, the pain will be there, but, but feeling like you probably could do a little bit more. And then working from that. So doing that consistently. And once you've done that consistently for a while, then building up slowly from there. Um, but yeah. In, in short, I wouldn't I wouldn't push through um, and I wouldn't avoid altogether. I'd find find a happy medium in there and do that on a between a good day and a bad day. You know, whatever, you, whatever you're able to do on a good day and a bad day. I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much, Mahid. The balance and act of living with persistent pain, certainly. Um, Nikki, I would I would like to come to you with a question from Panos, who is wondering what the panel thinks about practitioner communication. So the, what he means is the impact of messages imparted by GPs, physios, etc. What what that the impact of those messages can be on the patient experience, on, on a person's pain experience and eventual outcome. Is this something that you've experienced yourself? Yes, I, I think it's pretty crucial, um, the messages you get from your healthcare professional. Um, they can be hugely, we call them no see don't we? They can, they can be hugely negative or they can be hugely positive. Um, initially, when I went to see the neurologists and neurosurgeons and they would be telling me I had a really severe case and then later it became recalcitrant and intractable, and in some ways, I almost felt sort of validated by that, but that was very short term. And then it became very difficult and it entrenched in me a loss of hope, um, a loss of control. Um, it was it was actually really difficult. And while I you know, really respected their efforts to help me, it didn't improve the outcomes of any of my surgeries. It didn't help me live day to day life. I felt completely out of control that the pain, I had no control over the pain at all. So finally being able to have some hope and changing that locus of control into myself so that I could actually address my pain was so empowering. And if 
just one healthcare professional had taken that tack with me earlier on, that might have really changed my trajectory. Thanks very, thanks very much, Nikki. And I think it does again ties into what Cormac was explaining about the external stuff that can sensitise your alarm system. Um, I'm going to do one very quick, quick go to Sophie as a, as a final question, just because there's two questions um, that that have kind of merged together. One is when you're living with with pain. How are you, have you got any tips to help with sleep? And the other one kind of interlinked, how can you help How can you help me think straight when I'm living with this pain? I guess we're talking about kind of relaxation and, and, and the, the mind when you're in pain. Can I come to you, Sophie, for that? Yeah, hi. Um, it's going to be really tricky to give a very speedy response to both of those questions. Um, so I'm going to just very briefly cover sleep first, which um, and to say with sleep, what we tend to find is there's not kind of one magic cure for sleep. It involves changing habits very gradually, lots with lots of small kind of steps over a period of time. Um, and, and there's just so much that you can do. And I can't I can't kind of give it credit here. But what I would say is go away and look at sleep hygiene strategies but also thinking about you know ways to manage stress and the, the negative thoughts that love to show up for all of us in the middle of the night if we wake up um, and thinking about kind of meditation and mindfulness practices or having a little notebook next to your bed where you can write those things down in the middle of the night um, to come back to in the morning um, but definitely go away and have a look at, at sleep hygiene um, routines and give yourself time to implement those. So um, it takes a long time to change our sleep habits. Um, and often people will have a go at something and they'll come back to me a week later and say, oh, it's not had an impact, but really kind of give it give it a month, um, give each new change a month before you perhaps decide to, to try something else. When it comes to thinking, um, notice the thoughts that you're hooking into and think about the long-term costs of hooking into certain thoughts. So I think N Nikki mentioned earlier about self-criticism. And when you're struggling and you're feeling stuck with difficult life experiences, you're much more likely to have very self-critical thoughts. And the more that we hook into critical thoughts about ourselves, the worse we feel. And also when we're low in mood and, and when we're anxious or stressed, we have something called cognitive bias, which means that we're much more likely to tune into thoughts that are very negative or, or which hold us back. So notice what thoughts you're hooking into, acknowledge those thoughts and then do something meaningful with your behaviour. Engage fully in something, whether it's, you know, it could be making a cup of tea, it could be, you know, going for a walk, it could be speaking to a friend, but just find an activity that feels meaningful that you can just fully engage in, um, despite and, and with those thoughts showing up. Thanks very much, Sophie. 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 Sorry for wedging that one in. It is a, it's a big one to answer. Um, but if you did ask a question and we and we didn't get round to answering it on the panel, uh, we will be taking a, a transcript of the Q and A, so we can upload those to the website and answer more with more detail. Um, you can also email us on the uh, email address that's on the slide on your screen at the minute: info at flippandpain.co.uk. If you want to email us for for a more in depth answer or for something that didn't get brought up today. Don't forget to also follow us on social media to find out about future events at, um, at Flip and Pay across the board. Um, and there's also our website here, www.flipandpain.co.uk. So huge thanks to, to Cormac and all of our panellists for today. And we hope that we can see you all soon. Take care and goodbye.